Hi there. This is a two-part series. Okay, well, I should say it's two videos because it was so long. Um, in these two videos, these are for my subscribers only. Like I say in the video, it's not, I can't, you know, prevent non-subscribers from watching it. But my point is, is if you really, really like my videos, I have 15,000 plus subscribers. And I'd say out of that 15,000, I do think there's about 1,000. 7 or 8% that pretty much watch all my videos. So this is really for them, if you know, if you don't get bored by my rambling. But there's, I think, a lot of very, well, there is. There's a lot of really good advice and information in these two videos that are coming. This is going to be in the first video. The next one I'm going to post right after, so it'll be a part one, part two. In the first video, I talk about my left-hand progress, because I sort of made a vow that I was going to really work on my left hand to try to get up and running. And by September 1st, we'd see what my progress would be. But I want to do progress reports. The second part of this video, though, if you want to skip to it, it's about maybe three-quarters of the way in. I talk about some Ludwig snares, a Superphonic versus an, an LM402 versus, like, the LM300 series. Okay? So and that's really cool, too. And then what I do, and then it starts in the next video, I start talking about the Stuart Copeland snare model by Tama. Uh, and its relationship to the Pearl 1970s chrome over brass drums. And then finally, um, I, I talk about some advice I have for where you can really iron out your bottom triplets if you want to do a left-handed lead on a right-handed drum set. There's a, when you play jazz, there's, there's the concept of playing jazz if your right hand's riding the cymbal and your left hand's playing the snare, which is right-handed people do all the time. That's a very good way to really round out your left hand to right hand part of the triplet, okay? In a bum bum bum, left right foot, left right foot, okay? So that's in video two. So these are the videos. A couple times in the video you might see me uh, make a misnomer. I think I point to uh, the holes in the shell that are the tone control holes and I say the throw off holes or vice versa. But you know, thanks for watching my videos and what follows is part one. Hello. This is a four subscribers only video. Now there's no way to really enforce that. <laughs> but I seem to have, I have now 15,000 subscribers. And I think I have about maybe 900 to maybe like 1,800 dedicated fans. I mean, meaning, you know, they kind of really like watch my videos. So this is a video sort of for them, because I think it, most other people, they click on a drummer and be like, what the, you know too long-winded, blah, blah, blah. But this is a long-winded, but I think very interesting and helpful video. Okay, so for subscribers only. Okay, now check this out. What we're going to do is I, what I'll do, what can I do first? All right, here's a couple things. There's going to be some Stuart Copeland angles in here, some Ludwig drum buying stuff, some just pretty all-around tubular stuff. I hope it's tubular. So what I've been doing is, but first, we're going to get on to my left-hand practice. As I said back in June, or May, I forgot, I said I was working very hard on my left hand because I have, I know it's like a broken record if you've never really watched, I have a tremor, right? I mean, a lot of people do. It's nothing, you know, earth-shattering. But my left hand seems to be especially bad. I mean, it re I mean, compared to other people's tremors, my doctors even said, you know, they call it a benign essential tremor. I don't know why the hell it's essential, but that's what they call it. Essential must have another meaning in Dr. Berg. So, uh, but what I've been doing is, is trying to, and I've never taken it upon myself. I, it would be very convenient to say, oh, you know, the reason why I have a shite left hand is because I have a shite left hand, so I'm not even going to try. Well, I have been trying for a long time. But the thing really is, is it really, there's some disorder where they talk about, like, where people feel like they have another limb, like somebody else's limb on their body. It's certainly not that. And I'm not trying to make a joke of that, because that is those are really serious. People get their like limbs cut off because they feel like the you know somebody's arm is. They call it something something disorder. God knows I have numerous disorders, but that's not one of them. But the thing is, is that even like it really does feel oftentimes like I mean my left hand has its own mojo going on. Everything just feels different with my left hand. So what I've been really trying to do is I said in my original video, and then I put a progress video up maybe a month ago, maybe not even is things like this. So what I've been doing is, is I've made a conscious effort. I've always said in my videos, and it's my teaching philosophy, that when you play anything, when you do anything, right, but especially we're talking about drums, so we'll keep it on drums. We only have two arms, right? Most of us. <laughs> but what happens is, is when we do anything, any rudiment, or indeed when we play, 
we're only using those arms, but then any single stroke or any sort of non necessary, like even if you have, apart from coordination, right, like, like my basic. from that where you have like with jazz, like piano, right, where the right hand typically might solo and the left hand typically might play chords, or like a guitar where people's right hand kind of usually does this or picks, and the left hand usually forms chords, right? With drums, as with piano, because piano technically speaking you really can, I mean the, the, the um, independence in piano is really a basis for a lot of people when they wrote books like uh, Jim Chapin, the late Jim Chapin, God love him, to really drummers get their acts together really trying to do independence with their hands which now is a norm um, and essential or at least in all styles of music. Let me get this out of the way. But what I've been doing is, is my point is, is this. With drums when we do single strokes and everything <laughs> the right hand and the left hand mirror each other. Essentially, it's like you're volleying a ball back and forth, okay? This one does exactly this, this one does exactly this, this one does exactly, and it alternates, okay? If you're doing, when we do a paradiddle, but both hands are doing this. That's what the right hand, so if I were to take my left hand out, okay, that's what the hand, my right hand is doing. Left hand. Those patterns are intermeshed, okay? They're, they're overlapping, but each hand, we're not doing, if we did them simultaneously, don't. I mean, you can. It's a great, it's a, that is a great exercise to really compare the feel uh, uh, and, the, and the symmetry of both hands, as I've said in my, my symmetry video from, te, from five years ago. But what happens is we alternate, okay? That's the point. Okay? And the basic, most simplest, simplest, simplistic, most simple, the mirror the archetype of doing things back and forth hand to hand is the single stroke, okay? Because there's just one stroke involved. You know, it's not, okay? It's just, so. And I remember, um, as we all have, but this wasn't in the uh, video that, um, Mel Torme did, you know, the one that he sponsored, you know, the one that he was heavily involved with talking about Buddy Rich Part 1, Part 2. But there were a couple times, you know, Buddy Rich was kind of an asshole. I mean, he kind of was. Not an evil ass, but, you know, his temperament. A lot of people just have kind of asshole temperaments, or at least quick temperaments that make him seem like an asshole. So, I mean, he wasn't a true asshole, but he could be one, right? He could. A lot of, anybody can if you get him at a wrong time, you know? Get out of my way, F face. Yeah, I mean, but, the thing with Buddy Rich was, or guys like that, you know, and they're so, they're so good, you know, sometimes and you're living the lifestyle you are, and, you know, you have to, you can't be all soft and squishy, right? But, I, as it relates to this, I'm trying to really stay on the subject. I'm trying to control my ADD, or my ADHD, um, is, I remember a time somebody was saying, oh, yeah, I saw Buddy at, um, it, it was, it was a, a, a written down in an article or somebody told it to me, but essentially what it boils down to is somebody was like, buddy, you know, before, I think it was before a clinic he did at, uh, at Frank's Drum Shop. Like, what's the secret to your single strokes for the love of God? Well, he was sitting on a pad asking around before he went out to the drum set and everybody. And he, you know, looked at the drummer kind of with a jerky look, according to the, what I read, and just started going like this. which could be easily construed as like, yeah, just do it. But if you really think about it, I, th I think the person initially related like, hey, he was just a jerk, you know, like 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 if a football player had a great arm, right? You know, uh, Brady, right, Tom Brady or whatever. <laughs> What's the secret to a great pass? Well, if he just reeled slow motion, kind of went to do, you know, a pass and turned to you. It was like, yeah, you know, duh, you arsehole, right? But Buddy Rich, if you think about that, think about that. That's what it is. It's okay. Now, bear with me. Going back and forth 
the whole point of going back and forth, it's not so much that each hand, you have a couple things to think about, each hand's dynamic of how you handle it. And in my specific case, my left hand does certain things differently. It just kind of does the way it sort of is. I've been trying to streamline, make my left hand um, not necessarily exactly behave, do the exact same things my right hand does. It, it's a goal to do, but I found that there's sometimes my left hand, it kind of injures my left hand in the short run to do that if I try to do it exactly the same way. So sometimes with the other limb, you want it to allow it to do it its own way, right? But then the problem becomes is you can have sound differences. Like if it slightly strikes, if it strikes harder in a slightly different fashion, you can get an uneven tone. Duck, 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 duck. Like you could get a real fast single stroke roll. But if they weren't even, be like doo, 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 right? So the the key is then at very slow tempos, as is always said, which everybody blows over because a lot of drummers, myself included, would think, well, you know, oh, if somebody needs to really be taught that you're gonna just go left, right, left, yeah, there's something wrong with you. Come on, go hey, come on, already. come on already. Well, the point is as simple as a single stroke or any rudiment seems on the surface the whole point is is in the relationship of going hand to hand not just trying to make each stroke as they say you know even you know uh, sonically uh, the same uh, you know work on the dynamic level but also is the pulse of going the whole format of going from the right side to the left side back to the right side back to the left there's a smooth, there's like a highway there of smoothness, okay? I find with my left hand that that is a little bit jumbled sometimes. I'm not sure if it's uh, just an inexperience of my left hand or if there, you know, is, I mean, there's some neurological thing going on. But the point is, is most people do not have a neurological thing like this, however severe or mild it may be or essential or whatever. But as I'm going with this and I'm trying to keep, again, my topic up and running, as it relates to me then, therefore, air simple quad or whatever the hell it is, quad e pluribusidum, is I then just have that, well, let me do this. As I've said in my other videos, a single stroke or anything is only as strong or as uh, efficient as its weakest point, right? So what happens is, my theory, and it's common sense, is when people first start playing their drums, they're strong hand. Most people are right-handed, so it'll be the right hand. For those who it's left hand, it'll be their left hand. You're so used to doing stuff like writing and opening doors and shaving or other behind-the-scenes things, and their weak hand just isn't used to doing it. So right from the bat, your strong hand gets stronger and your left hand or your weak hand kind of just kind of languishes or just always serves as like the apprentice to the strong hand, right? So with a single stroke roll or anything, if your right hand can smoke it and your left hand's kind of like, uh, well, what was my, I think I equated it, I think I explained it in the video, it's it like if you have a seven-year-old kid pulling a, a two-year-old off to school, or a three-year-old, right? And the little, the little teeny kid can't walk really fast, his legs are really small, he's distracted by this on the ground, he wants to stop and do this. The seven or eight-year-old's like, come on, little Johnny, and dragging him along, you know? Well, that's what happens when you, when you work on things, okay? So what I'm doing is, is I'm just do, I'm doing single strokes by and large, um, and buzzes. But I'm leading with my left hand. But not just a simple, all right, lead with your left hand. All right, there you go. Because what happens is, is when your right hand can kind of do it fast and efficiently, just because it has this, or the strong hand and strong hand mojo, it forces, and I've said this in other videos numerous times, the weak hand to sort of talk, like go along and kind of be like, ha, 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 right? But so what you have to do is there's an optimal, comfortable speed like a, a max, a ceiling max of speed and endurance that sounds good, that also uses the least amount of energy. Did you play a bassoon? Is there a hair on that camera? Um, so what I do then is, is my left hand, I force my left hand to work, to my right hand to work at the left hand speed, right? So what I'm doing is I'm letting the three-year-old walk the seven-year-old to school. So what I do is I'll just sit, not just necessary, I mean, it's part and parcel that you're gonna be okay, like left, right, left, right, left, right, that you need to get, I mean, everybody needs, you know, to start, you know, certain roles and certain things with the left hand lead, it's good to smooth out your coordination and everything. But in this case, what this does is it really makes my left hand, I'm totally focusing on my left hand, its comfort level, its speed and its dynamic, and really letting 
the right hand, my strong hand, shadow. So instead of being my with the whole right hand emphasis with my left hand sort of like I'm just literally doing single strokes with just the left concentrating on my left hand and letting the right hand follow. other people, I mean, this is all common sense, but sometimes it's not all in the same batch explained in sort of a nice power where it all sort of makes sense or comes in handy, is it's good too, as I remember what the paradiddle I did before. Well, one hand in a paradiddle system of one E and a two E and a, the one hand goes one E and two E and in a standard paradiddle with the right, left, right, right, lead is the strong hand. Well, it does help sometimes to do these things simultaneously. Okay, now technically, I mean, whether or not you flam or not, I mean, you know how when you get the pop, the exact simultaneous? You know, like right there, like that, buh. I mean, that's like in, um, I always thought, I always think of a really good, this is a little jaunt into left field. In, um, ba -na -na, ba -na, purple haze. At the very end, though, when when uh, Mitch Mitchell done it, like -na -na, at the very end, that is a exact same time. There's no flam there. He's hitting at the exact same time. That's why the snare I think sounds epic. Anyway, but back to what we're talking about. Playing at the same time really enables me to then what I'm doing is pay attention to both hands simultaneously. As if I'm dribbling a basketball. In fact, I made that basketball video, which is true, I've been practicing my left hand dribbling a basketball. Um, and of course, it's not nearly as, I mean, it's it's any, I mean, I already shave, I shave, you know, in all fairness, I do eat with my left hand, I always have. Um, if I ever play hockey, which I don't, but if I'm out assing around with a hockey stick, I'll do it lefty, okay? Uh, but by and large, I do everything else righty. Um, but I, I went out of my way some years ago to learn to brush my teeth with my left hand to try to give it some, to try to achieve some sort of repetitive, burn it into my brain sort of automatic ability to not just do something, but also you have to mind the fine motor movement of it, right? Because if you're not, if when I first did it, was practicing, practicing brushing my teeth with my left hand, there were a couple times I almost shot the toothbrush, I mean, like, you can hurt yourself. If you're not really thinking, you're something like, Ugh! I mean, your right hand, you know, I was so used to it with the right hand where it's all built in, you know, where it's reflexive, you know, where you really get to the point where it just happened. It, it was really helpful to learn to brush my teeth with my left hand. I did notice some help, but I mean, at first, it, or some, um, you know, it did seem to smooth certain things out of my drumming. But, um, you know, as a quick aside, I did almost a couple times, like, I mean, I did hurt myself sometimes, you know, you just, without thinking about it, you just blast the, you know, the three-year-olds mowing the lawn, not the seven-year-old, right? Okay, so, so here we go. So what I would do sometimes is just the symmetry method, like I talked about five years ago, you know, you just kind of eyeball and make sure kind of each hand, and this is for sound. It doesn't necessarily... Everything doesn't have to look or be done the exact same way, but it sure helps for if it helps with the way it sounds. If the right hand is doing something a certain way, an exact sort of method, it might really help if the left hand's doing it the same way because you want it to sound just as even and have the same tone. But if your left hand can do it and achieve the same tone, like in trad grip, the left hand isn't doing it, it's entirely different, right? But with practice, I do this so horribly, I've been trying to do it, you can get the sound even, right? So anyway, back as then I go, so I will sometimes do the simultaneous, just match grip, because I don't, you know, I mean, actually, I'm, you know, I actually have farted around doing traditional grip both-handed. Why not? You might not ever use it in a playing situation, but good experience for your strong hand anyway but also too when I was talking before about stuff going back and forth the whole roadway of going from the right side to the left side there might be you know there's a whole total there's a symmetry there that really might assist in sort of 
working your neural whole systems back and forth. I'm not kidding. It sounds ridiculous, but it's true. Hopefully some scientist will say, By God, Mr. Keating, that is right. I think that could be helpful. I'm spitting all over the joint. Because when I get interested in stuff, I spit chunkies. Anyway, so then what I do is I will do rolls very simply with my left hand lead, not very fast. And the important thing is to do them for a while. It's very hard for me because I'm ADD guy. I mean, I'm really like, I'm shiny bunny, man. I'm like, oh, that drum looks cool. Oh, I feel like going upstairs. I'm gonna... you got to force yourself to do it for chunks of time. It will burn it into your brain somewhere, either your uh, cerebellum or your medulla obligata or your right hemisphere or your whatever, the hippocampus, whatever it is in there that governs these things. Anything you do for a long enough period of time, it assimilates. That's where evolution comes from. Not the process of necessarily, you know, the big process where things die off and therefore they're out of the gene pool, so that's what gets rid of the crappy stuff. But just learning to do something, okay? So in this case, just left hand leads. Just with singles, if I totally let my left hand, or in my case, like the three-year-old run the show, and my, my you know, seven-year-old like this, has to kowtow. I'm not thinking about an absolute speed. I'm thinking about a, a, a comfortable level, a nice comfortable uh, with endurance level where it sounds nice and even. With my left hand at the helm. Okay, there's no absolute speed there. Okay, it's just my left hand. And, and it's important to remember that for me the whole time I'm doing it. We'll do like an open and close thing where I will get up to a speed point where it feels like my left hand. You find that point where suddenly it feels like it's extra hard work for your left hand and starts getting tired. Well, that's your maximum or my maximum speed to be doing this. And then you work, you back it off a little. And since I've really, really honestly been concentrating on this, it has been very helpful. Like I really feel my left hand getting stronger. Now it still has sort of the fits and starts and a little bit of the jerk sometimes. Like for my fine motor, my body, sometimes that really does happen. Okay, see that? That's my right hand. Now I'm a little um, wiry now because I really, I mean I don't drink a lot of caffeine but I love coffee. Been, I just love the taste of coffee. So I put a little caffeine in it. Because, you know, a little caffeine, believe it or not, doesn't, doesn't hurt ADHD or ADD. You know, the stuff they give them for that Ritalin and these things, they're a, they're a speed. Well, caffeine's kind of a speed. So I do find, believe it or not, if I drink a great deal of it, sometimes I actually I feel chill. <laughs> and I feel nice and relaxed. And my, my this actually kind of does subside a little bit. But it, that happens at like a higher threshold. It might be a lot of caffeine, and suddenly I might not be able to sleep at night. So in this case, I just sort of keep it low. A, a, a side effect of that is sometimes for a while my left hand will be extra shaky. But this kind of really is about the norm now. Okay, I think I had the coffee a while back, so this is about the norm. Back to my single strokes. Again, with a very conscious effort and 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 thought and feel with keeping my left hand the boss here, okay? My right hand can just sit and do its thing, okay? I mean, I'll still fire it around in a big practice thing and do other stuff, like try to work on my molar or whatever the hell it is, uh, just play time and practice and everything else. But I find this very helpful. So that is pretty much the progress at this point of August 1st, 2015, of my left hand. Let's move on to some other stuff, okay? Remember, subscribers only. The drum I have here. Is. Check this out. I'm going to take off my headphones. This is an LM302. Okay, Ludwig, uh, in about 2003 or 4, maybe a little earlier than that, brought, started selling some imports. You know, they, they put their name on. This is one of them. Okay, you see the black and white badge? Badge. Okay, it doesn't say made in, you remember the old rockers will say made in USA on this badge, right? Back in the day, there were also some pointy, believe it or not, black and white badges. Okay, but this is an import. This is from China. Ludwig had the LM300, the 302, which are the steel versions, okay? Six and a half this is, because it's a 302. 
They had the LM303 and 304, which were brass. 303 was 5.5 by 14. The 304 was 6.5 by 14. <gasps> the 305 and the 306 were bronze. The 305 was 5.5 and, and the 306 was 6.5. Now, with Ludwig American made stuff, like the Supra, Supraphonics and stuff, and the Supras, their shallower one is always, it's a 5 by 14, okay? 5 by 14, then into a 6.5 by 14. Well, the import stuff would be 5.5, okay? That's sort of like the import sort of standard. So check this out. This one was really neat. I got it on eBay a, a few weeks ago. In the LM300 series, they had the regular standard, like the, the good butt plates, okay? That's what you'll see on a modern Superphonic and modern Ludwig expensive drum, right? This person, what they did is they put a P83 on this, God love them. I love these P83s. You know, they're just so durable and they and they and they just work so nicely. Sometimes the seventies ones are just the plastic in there. They're just, or the crappy pop metal, whatever. But the whole spacing on these tone controls on the three hundred series was the same. Like it's the same for the lugs and it is the same for the throw. The spacing proper. Although the hole itself might be a little smaller. But on the, a lot of those imports what they do is the, 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 the mount or I'm sorry, the throw off is mounted like the lugs, where the screws hit it from the inside to the outside. So you'd have to take the head off to remove the strainer. So then, and I've done this before too, on, on the 300 series drums I owned, uh, I had both the brass and both the bronze for a few years, and it, I widened the holes just a teeny bit so I could use regular screws and put on, I did put on, in fact, I, I, I did put, um, do what this person did, P83s and P85s on a couple of them. Looked was cool, but anyway, so I bought this on eBay. I think I got like 80 bucks or something, maybe. And this person also did install a tone control, sort of an old, you know, 60s into the 70s. You know, they use these on acrylites. Okay, they are similar. You know, there were a couple different versions of the small knob. Real fast on the Super Ludwig's, Super Ludwig's, the small knobs in those 50s and early 60s. The stem here. See how this one starts out thicker at the shell. It moves thinner as it gets to the knob. Well, the other way around. The knob end would be thicker and it would be, you know, like a vortex into a smaller diameter toward the shell. Although later chrome over brass bottle models might have indeed come with this exact tone control where, see how thick that shaft is, okay? Um, but this is my favorite of the Ludwig round knob tone controls. It's beefy, the whole thing's cast, it's, you know, it's machined, I mean, you know. Anyway, but look at that. So isn't that nice? So I got this. It's a steel shell, essentially, you know, not really. I mean, it's not um, uh, spun, but it is rolled and welded. And the tone control and a P80. <laughs> Three for like 80 bucks. It's terrific. Because I wanted to, you know, I really kind of, I'm getting back into the sound of steel. So I got this guy. A neat thing about this is, too, is you'll see the position of, okay, here, check this out. Here's your 12 o'clock, right? Well, on Ludwig snares, if you hold it like this, you will see that, you know, typically, you know, when you play the drums and you put the throw off on your left side if you're a right handed drummer, then therefore the throw off is at the 9 o'clock, right? But plate is at the 3 o'clock. Well, typically in Ludwig Berg on the expensive stuff, starting at about 63 ish or earlier, maybe 60, they start putting the tone controls up here. So it would be on the far side of you, right? So if you had the center, you'd have to go reach up here. But originally, they were back in this neck of the woods toward your, your groin, right? Because it was closer. But I think what happened was, is maybe it realized that it was hard, maybe for, for drummers to do this, so they moved it around to opposite, you know, like to the um, 1 o'clock or 2 o'clock position, because it might have been easier just to reach and just do it this way. I, I don't know why they did it, but I do know that very early Super Ludwigs, the tone control is in this position, okay? And then later on... They, they moved up to here to the position that it's in now, just you know, just opposite the badge, right next door to the badge. And I have seen quite a few fives and six and a halfs Super Ludwig's that were drilled for. Th there's holes in this position, but the tone controls here. I, that was done at the factory. In my, it was because when you you can see the holes and the chrome. The holes are chromed. I mean, it's not. it wasn't done after the fact, right? Anyway, quick interesting aside. So this drum, very nice. And here's another thing, too. I, back in the day, with Superphonics and Supras, Ludwig did put classic lugs on Supras and Supras around the time in 84 when they were moving to Monroe, okay? Uh, North Carolina. They ran out, of, from what I understand, is they ran out. Give me two seconds. Ding, ding, ding. 
Okay. Here is an actual lot alloy with classic lugs. This is an original, okay? It's the gold badge, okay? Chicago, Illinois. This is one indeed that I'm talking about. I actually own a few of these. This is the only six and a half I have at the moment, but I have three or four of the fives. And also two people say, well, in commemoration of the um, 75th anniversary, too, they did use these lugs. But I think I really, and that's true, I think. You know, there were some 75th anniversary badges or whatever with these lugs. But I, I did hear from some people that they ran out of, of Imperial lugs and used these guys. But where I'm going as a practical matter with this is sometimes on eBay, you, right, look at this, see, no, no, you'll see this, right? With the badge and the thrower and everything on this side. So you just see this. A lot of people have assumed that this, right, is, is, well, remember, this didn't come on it, right? This was installed, but this, okay? Like, oh, it's, it's an LM series. Well, no. I've seen many a Superphonic 6.5 and 5 go for really cheap on eBay because people assumed that these guys were those, okay? In fact, that's how I got this thing so cheap. I got this <laughs> got this for like, I think, $85 a few years ago because it was on eBay. That was the only picture. People thought it was an LM300 series. All right, so that's a nice little bit of knowledge. I'm trying to be helpful. I'm trying to just make some quality videos. To my subscribers or anybody who's interested but what I also bought the other day now some years ago of what I bought the other day pause move on to a little jut the Stuart Copeland model snare from Tama right 1.5 mil thick shell has a bead like Tama stuff does you know they designed that you know they want to sell something you know Tama's a, or, uh, Copeland's a, a famous Tama endorser 